chapter 12 of the essential environment goes over freshwater oceans and the coast. And it starts with a video that I recommend called Louisiana Disappearing, Living on the Brink. But it, this video basically talks about Louisiana losing about a football field of land um, into the Gulf of Mexico every year because a lot of dams, over 2,000, have been built in the Mississippi River Basin. And so instead of those rivers bringing down a lot of fresh land, the land is just being eroded by the ocean. So you can see in 1839 how much land Louisiana had um, then versus versus 2020. And so um, a lot of Louisiana is being lost to this damming um, a problem that they have. So the majority of water that we have in the world is 97.5% um, is in oceans and it's too salty for us to drink or even to use for irrigation. Only about 2.5% is fresh water that is usable free from from, from salts and is pure enough. Um, so freshwater ecosystems um, are in a like interconnected, like always cycling web with each other. Rain will bring down um, fresh water. You'll have um, wetlands, oceans that will cycle different nutrients through. They'll also um, exchange, uh, you know, soil gets moved around. Different things interact and these bodies of water um, in one way or another, are somewhat all connected to each other um, eventually. So freshwater systems will cycle water over long distances, and here's different types of, of water systems. The surface water is the water at the very top of the Earth's surface, like in a water or lake, and groundwater is locked up underneath the water, um, and it lives in basically pores or different um, holes in the rock. So the upper border of the layer that's completely filled with water is called the water table. And different water will like go and leach into that water table um, and recharge it. And so this is called the recharge zone. So some aquifers are basically completely confined where the the water is almost in like a, a rock pot underneath the um, ground. And then there's other areas where it's an unconfined aquifer where um, other things can run into it or water can permeate through and into that. So when we get runoff so like we've had a rain in the area a lot of rain has come down you can have something called runoff and a lot of runoff will go into our other like streams or rivers sometimes causing contamination a lot of times causing contaminations are out into our oceans so we have to be aware um, and try to keep those areas clean um, near a river you or stream the area um, around the river or stream you can see here in this in this gif here here's the normal size of the river or stream and then here is a picture of it being flooded the area right next to it is called a flood plain and it it's an area that can be dry at some parts of the year or or flooded at different parts of the year and near the river you'll have a special ecosystem calling called a riparian zone or a riparian forest where certain plants and animals will live there because it's especially fertile soil and because it's an area with um, a decent amount of water. When you have a lake or pond, it's not just just the lake or pond. Um, this has been broken up and studied by scientists at different levels. So the littoral zone is right on the edge, outer edge rim of the lake or pond it's usually very shallow and will have like baby fish and sometimes little plants that are growing up the benthic zone is basically the bottom and of the benthic zone you'll have the lim limnetic zone which gets some sunlight and the profundal zone which does not get any light and totally lacks photosynthesis so the earth is covered with um, different oceans but they all um, 
basically converge at different points and so they are all connected even though we divide them up. Um, oceans are very complex in how they are, um, how they mix, how they move, the different levels of salt and sunlight. Um, it, it's, and this is a good picture that shows how some of the, this is just um, some of the currents that are moving in oceans around the world. And there's a great um, video that you can watch on this um, that I'll, I'll get to that one in a minute. But this one specifically deals with upwelling. So very cold water down at the bottom will be very salt rich. It'll, it'll be very cold, very salt rich, have tons of nutrients, and it will move in very slow moving conveyor belts across the ocean. Right here in Southern California, we do have some upwelling, um, which is why our waters tend to be very cold, but um, we also have very nutrient rich water because of that upwelling. Um, and there's that video that I had there is called um, What is Upwelling? And it's from the Hakai Institute. So I recommend that you watch that one. Um, once you get out into the water, and I'm, I'm skipping one of the pictures here, but you have, um, after the dry land, you have water that's shallow covered by ocean water, and it's called the continental shelf. After the continental shelf, there will be a shelf break where there's a slope that goes down um, into much deeper waters. Um, a thermocline or a halocline is an area where there is um, a current system where um, halocline's specifically are talking about areas where it's more or less salty than the surrounding water. And a thermocline is an area where it's more or less um, like hot or cold than the surrounding water. You can actually see these areas. You would, you would think that areas of more salt or less salt, if they're next to each other, they're just going to mix and be homogenous all the way through, but they actually don't. In many cases, Salt, saltier water or hotter water or colder water will actually stay separate and you can feel this as a diver when you're out in the ocean or even if you're just free diving in a lake or in the ocean you can actually feel as you move down different thermoclines and just at one level it suddenly gets about 10 degrees colder these areas will have different densities so they don't mix um, as easily or as readily as maybe you would think. Um, so ocean currents is ho are how the water is moving around the world through the different oceans. And there's a great TEDx um, called How Do Ocean C Currents Work? I highly recommend you watch that and get a better idea of that. But part of the ocean currents here in Southern California are affected by the El Nino and the La Nina. And um, there's a good video on that as well called El Nino and La Nina Explained by U.S. Ocean Gov. But essentially, during an El Nino, the warmer water is, is pushed towards our, um, our like Southern California area like or the um, South America. It's pushed here towards, you know, us, Central America. And with it, it brings a lot of storms, a lot of extra water, a lot of good rains. During La Nina, you can actually have that warmer water pushed more towards the South Pacific. Because of that trade-off, a lot of times when we are having, you know, an El Nino year, it's giving countries like Australia a drought. Well, the last um, this these cycle through every two to eight years. Um, as of the making of this video, the last El Nino in California was 2015, 2016, so we're a little overdue. Um, and in Australia, they have had some very wet years recently. So there's these interesting videos that talk about how, um, because they've had such wet years, it's caused a lot of 
um, growth in their crops. So they've had a mice plague. They've also had a lot of spiders coming out of the floodwaters. Um, so it's interesting to watch those videos. So marine and coastal ecosystems are very different and they also are separated by various zones based on these things. The topography, like the shape of the land, the temperature, salinity, nutrients, sunlight, um, all of those will affect it. Um, specifically, an intertidal zone is the area right next to the land and the water. And for part of the day, it's covered in water and part of the day, it's on dry land. So the creatures that live there have to be used to living in underneath water or exposed to the sun, being very hot or being very cold, having high salt, having low salt. These have to be very, very hardy creatures that can live in the intertidal zone. Um, tides are the rising and falling of our waters based on the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon that pull are strong enough to actually make them move. Estuaries are bodies of water where um, some some fresh water is basically um, feeding in or pouring into some salt water. And um, again, the, the species that live there have to be used to, if it's, if it's drier, then it's going to be more salty. If it's, you know, there's a lot of rain and runoff, then there might be some pollution, but there's also a lot more fresh water. So the organisms that live there have to be used to the rise and fall of, of what's coming in with the river water and also changes in the salt concentration. So salt, salt marshes um, are also susceptible to that. They have rising and falling tides. They can have a lot of biodiversity, but specifically these areas are extremely good filters for pollutants and they really stabilize shorelines because they're bringing in a lot of new soil to the area from land instead of just being eroded by the oceans. One of the um, species that can live there are mangrove trees. Mangrove trees are awesome for, um, they are trees that can live in the salt water. They have their root system and they almost like stand up in the salt water. And because of that really cool root system, you'll have a lot of little um, organisms, fish, snakes, um, turtles, all kinds of things that will, birds that will live in here and hide and hunt and look for food. Um, we in Southern California have the kelp forest and the kelp forest, kelp is a type of algae, not plant, but they do photosynthesize and our kelp forest will actually grow big and huge and all these little creatures will live in that, come lay their babies and look for safety and like it's almost like a nursery for our fish. Um, in the summer, this is highly affected by the temperature. When the temperatures rise above about 70 degrees, the kelp is very affected by that and will die. So when our water gets warmer in the summer, you'll see huge amounts of this dead on the beach because it got kind of warmer. Um, this is also where even small changes in ocean temperature, either the ocean um, getting warmer sooner in the spring or staying warmer longer in the fall will decrease the amount of growth and time of the algae, which will give um, animals less time to lay their babies and give their babies less places to hide. A coral reef is an area where um, different um, animals that are very closely related to jellyfish and, and do have like small tentacles will live and build these little calcium um, shells. And they can actually extend the land with this. They're very delicate and they form a um, symbiotic relationship with a tiny little plankton called zooxanthellae. The zooxanthellae and the coral have a symbiotic relationship where the zooxanthellae lives inside the coral, which is coral is normally clear or kind of whitish. The zooxanthellae that moves inside of the coral for safety um, will actually give the coral its color and the zooxanthellae will um, photosynthesize and give extra food to the coral for its payment to live there and pay its rent. Um, but zooxanthellae, when they start being overexposed to sunlight and hotter temperatures and the ocean increasing in temperature, they will actually overproduce um, toxins and the coral will basically expel them 
because they're overproducing toxins and so they'll kick them out. Um, once the coral does this though, the coral is said to be bleached because it's lost its color from its zooxanthellae. Um, at that point in time, the coral is very stressed because it doesn't have a way to make enough food for itself because it normally gets its food from this part in part from this symbiotic relationship with the zooxanthellae. So within a few weeks, the coral, if it does not take on a new zooxanthellae, will starve to death and die. And this is called coral bleaching. Um, so coral reefs are very important. There's a lot of animals that are corellivores that um, actually peck and eat the coral. They, they live there and they depend on the coral for, for home and for shelter and as, a, as food. Um, these are just different um, things that I saw when I worked um, in the Great Barrier Reef helping replant the coral. So coral reefs have a ton of biodiversity. This is bleached coral. What it would look like in this is more what it should like like and you will see different balmies. I have a few videos here you could watch um, of the bleached coral versus um, some videos that I took right next to it where it's it's a balmy that is very very healthy. Um, this yellow um, coral here is one that is um, very stressed because it has lost and expelled its zooxanthellae. So um, it becomes fluorescent yellow and if it doesn't take on a new coral partner soon, then it will die. So here's um, some of our team going out and working to replant the reef. Um, so I won't go into that in this video any further, but I wanted to show you a few um, videos here. One is from Reef HQ Aquarium um, the, of the Coral Reef. I would look at that. Um, that's who I worked with, and they have a great um, Reef HQ Aquarium that goes over the health of the coral. Also, this is a great video explaining the before and after the efforts to replant the Great Barrier Reef called How Scientists Are Restoring the Great Barrier Reef from Travel and Leisure. Um, it's a good, it's a good video. Um, so open ocean ecosystems have different levels of biodiversity. You have the photic zone, which is the top layers. You have the pelagic zone, which is considered like the open ocean. And then you can have benthic habitats, which are on the ocean floor. So all of these are different parts where you see different things at every le level. So with our like groundwater that we're, we're pulling out and we're using for human uses, humans are no surprise using with water at an unsustainable level. Um, and most of that water, about 70% is used for agriculture. So for growing our plants, which is a very important thing. Um, residential use, that means like what you use in your homes is only about 10% of our fresh water usage. So there's different ways that we can um, make make cutbacks. But first, I wanted you to check out this current California reservoir um, levels. I think that this is an interesting um, an interesting graphic to check out um, so that you understand how much water is left. Um, when groundwater is pulled out, like too much of it, we can actually have areas called sinkholes where the land actually collapses in. And here's a different sinkhole. I was near this um, sinkhole when it happened on the day that it happened. Um, it was really, um, it was it was scary to see this whole area just fall in. Um, a lot of people end up buying bottled water. Um, because they think it's somehow healthier than the water that comes out of their pipes. But you should really look up your local water district to see about their second by second testing that they do of different um, contaminants to see if the water in your area is healthy. But um, bottled water has major um, ecological impacts and in different testing, a lot of times it doesn't show up to be any cleaner. Um, check out this video. Tap water might be better um, than bottled water from Tech Insider. So to control different water sources, because we like to control the water ar around us, people build levees um, along the banks of water to hold water into different um, channels. Um, 
those you can have canals or aqueducts that that basically do this for us. We also build dams um, as res reservoirs, which are artificial lakes that store water for human use. The problem with um, dams is that they can have um, some costs and some benefits. Like uh, the dam is great up here. It's providing energy and recreational use, boating, probably fishing. These homes probably increased in value by having um, this big pretty lake there but then the people further down the river got their river reduced by having this dam there and additionally the ecosystem there is kind of getting robbed and fish aren't able to to jump up you, you you're breaking up the normal spawning areas so it's been kind of a thing over the last uh, few decades to remove dams in fact 400 have been removed in the past um decade um, and the goal is to restore ecosystems fishery recreation and and just to restore these habitats okay so freshwater solutions to get more freshwater available to humans um, different things have been um, proposed one is uh, desalinization you can look into that. There's some really interesting um, videos on desalinization. Some of that is happening in Southern California. Also to decrease our agricultural demand since that's the large majority of water usage. Um, some plans that they've had is to line our canals to prevent leaks, just, just stop the leaks, and also to make sure that we're not putting water intensive crops in areas that we don't have much water. Um, also in some places they have rainwater harvesting where they collect water in rain barrels and um, other irrigation methods. Water pollutants comes from a few different ways. On this side they have um, non-point source, in this area they have point source. Point source is when you can point to a specific factory or farm that's contained and say this is polluting into the water right here this factory is that would be a point source or like this tanker released a bunch of oil that would be point source non-point source places are when um, there's maybe just a bunch of homes here and the gutters you know there's rain and the gutters just kind of collect uh, pollution from all through the neighborhood and go into the water system that would be non-point source because you can't point exactly to the source and different water pollutions can be pesticides you know heavy metals acid like acid rain those are all different types of pollution the problem is is that about a thousand um, children do die every year from different um, waterborne diseases and people should be entitled to fresh clean water so when a lot of this polluted water feeds um, in Southern California actually from really far inland it goes out to the ocean and um, it can cause with all the extra fertilizer and runoff it can add a bunch of unnatural nutrients and and pollution but also unnatural nutrients is a pollution to the ocean causing a bunch of the plankton to suddenly have this boom where they they grow a lot all at once and while these can be really pretty because it can make like glowing um, plankton it can also be um, really harmful because it can choke out other organisms and it, it's very artificial so Here's a pretty version of it, even though it shouldn't be happening. And from Earth 8, Red Tide returns to San Diego, CBS 8, San Diego. So check out that video. It's kind of cool to watch. So wastewater um, is all collected um, by different... Um, wastewater is collected... Um, by different, like, organizations, sometimes um, reef repurposed and like cleaned up. I have a video on that called California plant transforming sewage into drinking water from CBS mornings that I recommend watching. Um, out in the ocean, we can have a lot of pollution. We have the great Pacific garbage patch, which is basically a gyre. It's like a dead zone where, where several currents meet and plastic ends up staying there. 
in that specific area, plankton, which is our like smallest organisms in the ocean, plastic actually outnumbers um, plankton in a six to one ratio. There's more plastic than plankton in those areas. It's, it's really crazy. Um, groundwater pollution is really problematic because it's very hard to clean out. It stays for a very, very long time. Um, in the United States, we passed the Clean Water Act in 1977, which funded like sewage treatment plants to clean this up so it wasn't just filtering, um, percolating, and staying in the ground for a long time. Um, this is the sewage treatment plant a video that I told you about that I recommend watching it. Um, in our oceans, we also have overfished in a lot of ways and different ways that um, fishermen will fish. This is just a few of them. One of them is purseining. This looks a whole lot like a, a purse or a bag where a net is circular and is indiscriminately thrown out there. It's got buoys on it so it floats and then it's kind of like pulled or tightened and brought up onto the ship. Um, it's pretty um, indiscriminate in, who, in what species it will pick up and so it's a little bit messy environmentally that way. Drift netting is where a net is held up with buoys but at a certain level that the fish that you're trying to catch um, will swim at that level so other fish that swim deeper or higher in the ocean you're trying to not catch those but still there's a lot of species that can swim at the same level. Um, long lines are when a lot of hooks are put out there with bait and so animals that like sharks if you want them to stay away from a certain beach sometimes they will float these long lines so that every shark that or whatever that comes nearby will stay off the beach for the people. This um, is, is pretty sad because sometimes you know you'll get whatever organ on the shark, a dolphin, um, a sea turtle that will bite onto this and drown slowly after a long time. Trawling is when a large net is dropped at the bottom and it's pulled along the bottom and it's specifically targeting benthic animals. Bycatch is when you catch something that you didn't intend to catch. Um, it's accidental, but you know, it, it should not be happening. Um, in 2003, scientists studied our oceans, what we had as far as fish before 2003 and at 2003, and we've seen a 10% decrease in how many large fish we have in the ocean versus what we had prior to 2003. Um, so in marine protected areas, a lot of, just like national parks, marine protected areas are areas of the ocean that are now being um, protected or marine reserves where you can't collect, um, you know, even shells or pick up or take anything and you also can't fish. In these marine protected areas, they have actually studied these and see that not only is the average organism about 31% larger than outside the marine. So, so basically a Garibaldi fish, which is common in Southern California, it'll be 31% bigger in a marine protected area than outside the marine protected area. Not only that, you see 23% more species diversity, 91% more organism density, and 192% increase in total biomass. So those are working, which is great. Another, um, Thing that oceans are facing, threat that they're facing is ocean acidification where the ocean becomes more acidic because it's um, a sink or a carbon, a lot of carbon dioxide is, is being forced into the ocean from the atmosphere and there it becomes acidic and it can do a lot of damage to seashells as it makes them melt away because it's an acid.